but I think probably we can get started now. We've got um, like almost 30 people here and uh, you want to be too late. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and introduce uh, Majid. Uh, apologies if my uh, sound isn't that great I'm doing this uh, remotely. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Majid uh, Ashbar. He's coming to us virtually all the way from University of Wisconsin uh, in Madison. Uh, Dr. Ashbar is a physician scientist and co-leads an NIH-funded clinical informatics laboratory in the School of Medicine and Public Health, uh, dedicated to the prevention of early uh, uh, to the prevention and identification of uh, diseases, with a focus on translational natural language processing. Um, the lab employs methods in NLP and machine learning, and they have a multi multidisciplinary team. Uh, he's built an infrastructure to perform NLP uh, machine learning uh, tasks with uh, electronic health record data uh, for high throughput computational phenotypes and applied predictive modeling. Uh, he received his medical degree and clinical training at Rush University and the University of Maryland. Uh, during this time, he also received his master's in clinical research. He is also the director of the Learning Health System uh, for UW's Institute of Clinical and Translational Research. Uh, he currently has an NIH R01 to implement and examine the effectiveness of artificial intelligence driven tools for clinical decision support. Um, he's going to talk to us today about utilizing the clinical narrative in the HR for clinical decision support uh, and give us some insight in implementing reproducible workflows. Uh, using an open source NLP engine in the cloud. Um, the presentation describes a reproducible workflow for cloud service to ingest, process, and store clinical notes from a major EHR vendor in an elastic cloud computing environment. The technical architecture incorporates industry leading and emerging technological capabilities. Uh, the overall NLP CDS infrastructure um, is protocolized with details to export the notes from the HR organize them and feed them into an NHLP pipeline uh, and then alert uh, physicians at the bedside. Uh, he also has an interest in uh, opiate use disorder. So I hope for uh, people interested in that, um, uh, the presentation will be enlightening. Um, so without further ado, uh, uh, Dr. Majid Astafar, I'll uh, give the floor to you. Thanks, John. I appreciate the introduction and the invite to provide this talk. Uh, so my name is Majid. Um, I'll try and track the uh, chat box uh, throughout the talk and, and try and answer questions that's come up. But please, by all means, do share your questions as, as we progress. Um, I'm like John mentioned, I'm here at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And my talk today is uh, from lab to bedside, I'm trying to do a, a little bit more of a translation NLP approach as I work with scientists like John and some of his colleagues and doing some of the development NLP work. Um, I think many of you guys are, are familiar with uh, the diffusion of innovation theory. You know, at the University of Wisconsin, I, I like to hope that what we're showing you guys is maybe among the more early adopter or innovative tools. Um, but certainly when it comes to applied AI or decision support with AI, uh, you know, there's there's certainly a lot of barriers and perceived lack of utility has, has always been one in terms of what is the, the benefit in some of these software tools and so and and same tone as kind of its uh, facilitators to adoption as well. So uh, I think the workflow that I'm going to show you today hopefully kind of heightens some of that awareness and kind of what we're doing here at Wisconsin to address. And I'd, I'd love to hear what you guys are doing at Alabama as, as kind of comparison and kind of benchmark. So when it comes to the clinical decision support, I think I, I kind of follow the traditional definition of, you know, the five rights framework uh, just to kind of set the stage. So we're all thinking of this the same way. You know, clinical decision support delivers delivering the right information to the right person in the right format, the right channel, and the right time. And so that's really trying to take the, the health knowledge and influence health choices by our clinicians and providers at the bedside. Now, obviously, with uh, the rate of publications and what we're seeing in literature, there's certainly plenty of, of prediction models out there, and, and it's quickly a, a big leaky faucet problem where there's across many stages of development and implementation where things tend to fall apart. And, I think we're seeing less than you know a few percentage actually making it to adoption into clinical practice. I think we're we're experiencing similar things uh, at Wisconsin, and so I you know we we have several things in place to try and identify these uh, early on. Um, not fit for purpose is obviously one of the major issues that comes up uh, from the very beginning. And so here we chartered a new committee called the Clinical AI and Predictive Analytics Committee uh, about a year ago um, that kind of follows the you know 
requirements of demonstrating uh, feasibility and practicability of, of any AI model or software, whether it's uh, developed in-house or from an outside vendor. And so we have a multi-stakeholder team of uh, implementation scientists, statisticians, machine learning scientists, data scientists, uh, ethicists, and uh, clinicians, and uh, other uh, some executive leadership to really kind of determine if uh, any implementation is, is going to be sought after. And this spans both a, we have kind of a dyad relationship between what's our health operations folks. And we have a whole, you know, applied data science team and enterprise analytics that are kind of focused on that with our data engineers and software developers, um, separate from our university, which has its own uh, informatics institute, which is part of our CTSA and some of the front door services that come with that. So here listed here, our CTSA, you know, provides, we have a implementation scientist within uh, one of our cores of a DNI launch pad. We have a protocol development and biostats kind of front door. We have informatic support. And then separately on the health system side are the kind of the operational correlates of some of these things to, to really kind of work in partnership. So the talk today is, is kind of looking at NLP augmented AI. Um, when I say natural language processing, I know there's different fields of NLP. Uh, John can certainly speak more to this, but you know, there's things from information retrieval, like search engines to information extraction, which are kind of what we more frequently see in, in medicine and building these computer phenotypes, name entity recognition. And so what I'm gonna show you today is a type of information extraction, but you guys I'm sure have become more familiar with some of the um, generation and Q&A systems that are coming out like ChatGPT and stuff like that. So there's certainly a wave in the future that um, I will put a plug in for at the end of this talk of some of the tasks we're trying to test around those newer systems. But today's talk is gonna focus a little bit more on information extraction. And so I'm hopeful that this is an, something of an early adoption that we've done here for AI-driven healthcare. Um, I'm going to give you a use case example of what we call the substance misuse algorithm for referral to treatment using AI, SMART AI is the acronym. Um, and that's our clinical decision support that is currently in silent testing. It's, it's actually now ready to go live March 6th. And then we're using that same information, the computer phenotype, to build a, a population health approach on the research side in a, in a data commons cloud that we developed, uh, which I'll introduce as well. So let's start with the use case and what is the actual problem we're addressing. So screening for opioid misuse. So United States Preventative, Preventative uh, Services Task Force recommends uh, screening for opioid misuse in adults. This is a grade B recommendation in both the outpatient and inpatient setting. Uh, NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse, actually worked with uh, uh, collaborators and developed a, a screening tool called the TAPS, uh, which is kind of an updated version of some prior validated self-report tools, questionnaire tools. Um, and they, if you go to their website, they actually have an EHR implementation version of it, which gives you kind of the, um, the elements that are required for uh, an EHR analyst. And there's two components to the TAPS. There's an initial universal screen, kind of a single question of, have you ever used drugs or alcohol? And then a follow-up screen that kind of gets more uh, stratifying risk. And this is, again, a self-report questionnaire. So you can imagine this has to be built into the workflows with the question, validated questions as developed and validated. At our health system, I don't know how it is at University of Alabama, but we don't actually have a formal screening program for uh, opioid misuse screening. We obviously have one for alcohol as required by you know, being a level one trauma center and, and we have an SBIRT program. Uh, but for opioid, it's kind of ad hoc consultations and identifications. We do have uh, an in, inpatient addiction consult service that's been in practice now for uh, over a couple of decades. We even have built-in universal questionnaires, kind of like the TAPS-1 version, but it was just built. Uh, no one is required to use it. Uh, there's no follow-up from it. Uh, it's actually just data that's sometimes collected and it's not acted upon. Uh, you know, similar to the problems we've been having across the country, uh, the numbers of hospitalizations related to opioid misuse and substance use disorders have only increased. Um, you know, we've, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic, we've seen uh, an, an increase in these events as well. Currently, our addiction consult service is uh, really it's an ad hoc service where it's the provider that's making, you know, just deciding when they want to consult them. So you can imagine there's uh, selection bias. We don't have formal epidemiology on what is the actual rates of substance use or opioid misuse in our health system and how many are being acted upon. So the question is, can we leverage the data that we have in the electronic health record to maybe provide a more systematic automated screening tool? Um, and so in this uh, setup, we're, we're looking at inpatient adults. And 
uh, we figured that maybe we can develop a natural language processing system that uses the notes. Um, as, as you guys may know, the intake, the admission HMPs or some of the progress notes really do, you know, we're trained in medical training and, and clinical training to ask questions around substance use. Uh, if patients come in with withdrawal or intoxication, those are collected in the history of present illness. And in fact, they're when we looked at kind of the a sampling of notes, you know, we found that the large majority of them have some mention of, of substance use, whether it's opioids or alcohol. Um, more structured data elements such as urine drug tox are not routinely captured. Those are again um, at, the, at the discretion of the provider. And given that most of the EHR data is in this unstructured format, you know, there's really a lot of information that we tapped into. And so the notion here is that, you know, can we use the, the notes as, as they arrive? And we're not looking at any particular note type. Uh, given that it's very hard to generalize note types across institutions. I know there's some one codes around this, but they're not really that reliable. And so we said, well, given that the average hospitalization is you know, two or three days, can we use the first 24 hours of information? Because that's typically when a lot of the documentation, the initial intakes performed, but provides enough time to, to um, do actionable knowledge off of that. And so we this basically wanted to train a model using the first 24 hours of data. And so in this approach, what we're actually doing is saying any notes that show up in the first 24 hours, we're using the kind of the timestamp approach versus a note type approach. So we just took in every, every uh, uh, information that comes in the first 24 hours. And so you can imagine, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different note types. Um, this is just a list of a handful of note types from one of the health systems I worked at. And um, like I mentioned earlier, within some of these note types, there's actually very pertinent information about substance use. And it's just kind of routinely collected information. It's not necessarily prioritized or acted upon. It's just kind of part of our, you know, SOAP note or progress note or HMP admission notes that we tend to collect on uh, information for our patients. And so in these examples, like there's a social history section sometimes we capture where, you know, there may be mention of, of substance use. In the initial reason that they came to the hospital, uh, you know, maybe they're coming in for endocarditis or, or complications from their substance use versus directly related to substance use, and then even the medications and drug sections on prior misuse. Now, in terms of how we use these notes and process them, um, you know, we use an NLP engine called CTAKES, which is the Clinical uh, Text and Knowledge Extraction System. Um, to do some pre-processing and feature engineering to kind of um, standardize the information into a useful format for machine learning algorithms. And so imagine again, taking the first 24 hours of notes, we kind of run this through this UIMA um, architecture that, that was developed for CTAKES. It's modular, it's Java-based. So, you know, I, I think there are other versions of this that you guys may be familiar with like Metamap or uh, which is from, I think that's NLM's version and then uh, Leo, which is I think what's being used at the VA. Um, and so on, but they're kind of all kind of uh, uh, trying to achieve the same thing where you kind of feed in this free text uh, character, alpha character numeric uh, strings of, of information from these documents, goes through a handful of an annotators and out comes the metadata file, right, which, uh, which contains the annotations that you'd want in that. And so what are these annotations? Um, these are, you know, boundary detection across the, the sentence or fragments of, of text, tokenizing them into whether words or characters, uh, normalizing them from um, the tense and things like that, as well as part of speech tagging. And here's an example of a note where once you go through this, those processes, now you can actually do some name entity recognition where you can actually map uh, different entity mentions to uh, a metathesaurus, like the National Library of Medicine's metathesaurus. That's the USMLE um, set of dictionaries across all ontologies, whether it's SNOMED, RxNorm, LOINC, uh, CPT, ICD. And so here you can take and identify signs and symptoms, diseases, diagnoses, medications, and kind of map them to concept identifiers. And so in some ways you're kind of converting this into somewhat structured data, right? So you, you can imagine um, in this next slide, you know, if there's a mention of opioid misuse or something similar to that, um, and the UMLS that has a concept unique identifier with that um, coded data right there. It's kind of like an ICD code in some ways you can, Think of it that way. And so here we're mapping synonyms to the same concept unique identifier uh, for opioid misuse or prescription. Opioid misuse has a different one. Family history may look different. And then we can normalize this across multiple ontologies uh, from SNOMED, LOINC, MESH, uh, mapping up to this universal kind of CUI, UMLS CUI. And so that's what we're using in terms of our inputs to the, the training of a model for building a screening tool. 
I would say that we, you know, this does take a little bit of effort. I mean, one of the reasons we're doing this is that we, tr I'll show you in a little bit, we train the model in a different location. And so saving a trained model with its vocabulary uh, brings in uh, PHI issues and, and wanting to, you know, share CUIs and things like that allows us to say that it's de-identified data because we've essentially converted to these uh, concept unique identifiers. And so it's uh, uh, basically structured data um, that's removed any of the identifiers that we'd be worried about um, when, when you try and strip out from the raw text. So in this 24 hour approach, essentially, like I said, we just concatenate everything that shows up in the first 24 hours. So you can imagine nursing notes, even radiology reports, discharge or any type of uh, progress notes or admission notes get all concatenated into the, a single document. And then that single document gets processed through C-takes, like I described earlier, into uh, the string of these CUIs, these CUI codes. So when we uh, initially developed Smart AI, um, it was a, um, we went to a health system that was routinely actually screening. There are very few health systems in a country that are doing routine uh, opioid misuse screening on their hospitalized patients. And so uh, Rush University Medical Center um, had a pretty robust um, uh, addiction medicine program and, and they were routinely screening all their hospitalizations that came through. Now, obviously routine is, is you know, I think when we looked at this across three years, we had 86,000 admissions, 60,000 of them were able to have completed that single questionnaire screen. You now those 60,000, the ones that screened positive, you know, there's obviously some drop off and um, some went directly to get that secondary screen. Others, you know, got the universal and followed up by the secondary, but we were able to get a pretty good sample size to kind of differentiate across different types of substance use uh, from both, uh, we kind of categorized to opioid misuse, uh, alcohol misuse, and then non-opioid uh, drug misuse. And then obviously all the negative screens that came along with that. So we actually had a pretty large uh, patient population that was from a single center, but it was one of the few systems in the country that really was doing this systematic wide uh, hospital wide screening that we could train data on. And so we were able to get all these labels identified. So these served as our grant with labels. And we took the first 24 hours of notes. And in fact, we actually looked at this across multiple different timestamps of first eight hours, the entire hospitalization, we kind of identify what makes sense for an operational system, as well as what, what helped train the, the, the model the best. And so we use that as input into our, our machine learning algorithm. And the machine learning algorithm here, so we did the feature engineering like I described off this uh, outside health system where we took all these um, um, notes and we converted them to the CUIs. And then these CUIs were trained in a supervised fashion against those ground truth labels that I showed you from that consort diagram where we had labels for uh, using validated self-report screening tools that were used to, to do the screening. In this case, it was the, it was an earlier version of what, what's now the TAPS, but it was kind of something called the audit, the alcohol use disorder identification test and the DAS, the drug abuse screening tool with follow-up questions about the types of, of drugs. And so that served as a ground truth label. We had the input from all the concatenate 24 hours of notes converted to CUIs. And we took this high dimension sparse kind of matrix of CUIs and we kind of um, fed it as a CUI embedding. So we kind of put it down into a lower dimension dense vector. Um, we did 300 dimensions here. And that served as an input into a handful of different architectures that we examined. We actually tried a rule-based approach. We tried a simple linear approach and we tried more complicated deep learning algorithms. And interestingly enough, it was a convolutional neural network, kind of shallow, but a convolutional neural network that worked the best for us in terms of performance metrics. And so we, this is a figure showing kind of that embedding layer going to a, a, a CNN um, and then the output, a sigmoid output of, of having a multi-label approach of uh, having any level of alcohol misuse, opioid misuse, or other drug misuse. So a person, uh, individual can certainly have all three. So when we tested this, um, you know, for our health system, we were focusing on the opioid version of this. Um, while it was a multi-label classifier, we only turned on the opioid part. But before we, you know, I brought this to the hospital committee, we did some external validation. We did it both as a temporal validation at the existing health system where it was trained at with a more recent data set using COVID, uh, the COVID time period. And then we actually took the model and ran it at another health system uh, that was um, not an urban, it was a more of a suburban uh, health system with a different demographics and different um, patient attributes at the population cohort level. And you can see that we looked at both the area under receiver operating characteristic curve as well as a precision recall curve. And we had pretty good metrics across both. 
when we try to identify the best cut point for opioid screening, uh, we were able to come up with a cut point that gave us a sensitivity and specificity of 87, 89%, and a positive predictive value of 76%. So this kind of gives us a discrimination metrics of you know, differentiating between cases and non-cases for positive screens. Then we want to kind of look at the calibration of the model in terms of how does the observed rates compare to the predicted uh, probabilities. And so using that PPV, first of all, we were able to, to identify that the number needed to evaluate to identify, you know, um, uh, number of patients screened that are true screens, you know, for every 1.3 patients for opium misuse that are screened positive, one, one will be true. So when we extrapolate that across kind of the inpatient wards, when we see several thousand patients a month, we're talking about 26 alerts per 1,000 patients. Then we kind of want to look at the calibration metrics on this. So in terms of what I described earlier between this uh, graph here and the predicted versus observed probabilities. And so um, the null hypothesis is that we have a slope of one and zero intercept, which is perfect calibration. And you can see when we did our um, calibration here, we actually failed to reject the null, which means that the p-value was above 0 0.05 and it was actually good, well calibrated. It's close to the zero and one. We also looked at some um, disparity metrics to identify for any disparities. And when we ran this uh, model across subgroups, so we looked at uh, non-Hispanic black and non-Hispanic white. We actually looked at a, a, several other demographics as well as area deprivation and disease and sex and age groups. Um, but I'm here, I'm just showing you the non-Hispanic black, non-Hispanic white, mainly because with opioid use disorders, a lot of stigmatizing language, a lot of stigmatiz stig stigmatization towards individuals of color and, and other backgrounds. And so here we looked across not just false positive rate and false negative rate, but uh, just for simplicity, I show those results, but we also looked at false emission rate, false detection rate. Um, and you know, there was, um, for the most part, when we looked at confidence intervals, there was uh, some overlap and didn't seem that there was a clear disparity in performance of our model. Lastly, we wanted to get at some face validity. And so we use Lyme. Um, local inter interpretable model agnostic explanations to try and do surrogate linear modeling on individual case predictions and look at what were the top features in those kind of local surrogate um, snapshots. And when we did this on a sampling of several thousand patients and kind of averaged them over, we saw that the highest weighted features were things that actually provide good face validity. Mentions of heroin, smokes tobacco, cocaine, victim of abuse. These are the text features of the CUIs that were identified. Opioids, methadones, drug abuse. Um, drug abuse, obviously abuse is stigmatizing, but that's one of the UMLS terms still. Uh, heroin dependence, Suboxone, things like that. So at this point, we've um, trained, um, developed, and uh, validated both temporally, externally. We've looked at calibration discrimination metrics. We've done some uh, bias um, and fairness metrics. We've done some face validity. We took this to the AI and predictive analytics committee with kind of an A3 submission, from single page submission, uh, went through some rigors of, of um, demonstrating need and they approved it. And so what we did now is we actually have spent the last um, probably well over a year implementing this into real time. I would say near real time. And basically from the time you register a note to the time it actually brings back to clinical decision support, we're talking about five minutes. And so this is the architecture that was designed. So I'll kind of walk you guys through this. So our electronic health record system here is Epic. Uh, so we have a local on-prem Epic instance. Um, we used uh, an HL7 um, vendor software to, to kind of organize and, and do kind of the data feeds, uh, basically TCP mes messages that are communicated using HL7 application protocol through Cloverleaf into um, our HIPAA secure UW instance of Microsoft Azure. Uh, and so that's our, our cloud computing environment. So here we actually then, as the notes are, are registered in Epic, Cloverleaf brings them, does an HL7 feed up into the cloud. And once these um, notes are brought into the cloud, they're organized in our data lake. Um, in this case, we're using Databricks. Um, and we have multiple, we have a CTAX instance and then does that feature engineering that we described on the notes. And so out comes the CUIs. And then we also have the identifiers that come along with the CUIs so we know which patients they're for. We're doing it in the first 24 hours. So we process the CUIs. Um, we, we now store them as, as, uh, as they show up um, from the notes concatenated together. And as more notes show up, we then reconcatenate and update the scores. And so we continue this process as needed for 
really any decision algorithm that uses queries for ma uh, machine learning. So here the queries are kind of organized and then they're fed into the trained CNN model I showed you guys earlier. So they're put into query embeddings, fed into the smart AI and that smart AI outputs the predict probability just for one of the, I mean, it, it does it for the full smart AI, all multi-label um, alcohol opioid and non-opioid, but we wanted to just use the opioid score for our opioid screening misuse. And so the scores are then registered and those scores are then, there's an HTTP call from Epic's cloud, uh, which is called Epic Nebula, uh, which brings in those scores. And that's how we then connect back to our on-prem Epic is we have to go through Epic Nebula. So then the on-prem, uh, the Epic cloud uh, takes those scores, patients that meet the threshold for that sensitive specificity I described to you, the cutoff, um, the screen positives are then fed back in and they arrive in the electronic health record. When anyone opens a chart, if someone, was above the threshold, they then get this thing called the best practice alert. So up, uh, what pops up uh, from the provider opening the chart for patient that's screen positive is this BPA that says, patient has been identified by a screening classifier for unhealthy opioid use using data from the clinical notes collected during routine care. The goal of BPA is to screen for unhealthy opioid use and identify patients at risk. Would you like an addiction consult order? And you have to put in that order or you have to give a reason for why not. Um, this actually went through multiple iterations. We, our implementation scientists did do some user-centered design feedback around this, and we recruited and did about uh, six or seven interviews with end users to make sure that this BPA was designed a way that was useful to them and informative for them. Currently, we uh, are on this BPA to be able to track activity. We built a workbench report, which is another service at Epic that we can use. Essentially, anytime a BPA fires, it gets recorded into this uh, workbench that we can pull up and review. Uh, we get the predicted probability score from the smart AI that, that met above that threshold. We find out if a consult was actually ordered from it. Um, if they didn't order the consult, what was the override reason? When was the BPA fired? When was the consult ordered to know it, it was uh, uh, plausible from a timely standpoint? Who were the users? What was the service? We can go and look at the patients. And so this sets itself for kind of a pre-post implementation kind of quasi-experimental evaluation to really determine, yes, we showed the performance metrics on prediction were appropriate, but does it actually lead to any effective care? And so this is where we tie this into health outcomes to see the lead to additional consults that led to actual interventions and um, down the road outcomes like readmission or death. And so we're, we're now tracking that. So in summary, you know, in order to get this um, from uh, development into production, we you know, developed a model in, in our lab. We had to get approval from not just the one hospital committee I mentioned to you, but we had to go to the adult inpatient committee, the nursing committee. I can't name how many committees we had to get through this. We used our DNI launchpad from our CTSA to go through some iterative user design feedback on the BPA and, and how to best disseminate the knowledge. Uh, we've given grand rounds, we've given out newsletters, We've in-serviced the addiction team on the fact that it'll be receiving consults from this tool. And now we're in this kind of PDSA, plan, do, study, act, rapid PDSA cycle to try and iteratively continue making sure fidelity is met now that we're gonna go live on March 6th and then start to track some short-term outcomes and really helpful with the goal to try and see, can we come to a decision to keep implementing or de-implement within a matter of six months uh, for operational and business needs. Um, we'd like to kind of avoid the longer delays from research studies. And then coming back, we, we do have um, biannual uh, visits to the Clinical AI and Predictive Analytics Committee to see if there's um, calibration drift or any issues with the model as the model becomes, if it, be, if it is effective, does actually then change the workflow and the model's performance over time. And, and as medicine updates and things change as well, does the model start to fall off? So that's a, a kind of a run through for what we've designed and implemented uh, using an AI driven NLP for clinical decision support. Now you can imagine this um, NLP tool is identifying individuals across our hospital systematically, comprehensively. Um, and so it'd be nice to use that information for patient you know, uh, population health purposes. And so here, what we're doing is we're gonna take this information and actually bring it over to our other cloud computing environment on the university side, which is a separate Microsoft Azure instance, which is um, meant for research. And it's, that's another HIPAA secure environment. Uh, and in this setting, we're building a data commons. 
And so the problem here that we want to address with capturing these individuals is, can we actually bring in other data elements to better understand what happens outside the hospital and work with our local health departments and kind of bridge that gap between our health system with our catchment population and the health departments and county health departments that are serving that same catchment population. And so in this situation, we're talking about siloed data sets, right? The health department has their own ambulance run data system, vital records, PDMP, um, as well as some other outside you know, claims data from other hospital visits and things like that. And so our question is, can we do kind of a robust health information exchange and actually bring these silo data sets and link them up with our patients who are identified from our hospitalization so we can learn about what happens to our patients outside the health system. You know, what I described to you guys with an operational inpatient service, but obviously there's more research that needs to be done in terms of what happens to these folks when they leave the hospital. So um, this was kind of a summary of what I showed you earlier where we have Epic and it kind of pushes out the notes, runs the classifier, brings it back for, for decision support. And what I'm going to show you next is, okay, well, what if we actually take those same individuals I identified and bring them over to developing a substance use misuse data commons? And so in this case, we're using all the labels from the smart AI classifier plus ICD codes for cohort identification purposes. And then we're going to use those uh, individuals and link them up with outside agency data and bring those into the, into the substance use data commons as well. So now we have a data commons across multiple data sources for our linked patients. Now, how do we do that? I think we learned from best practices in this field, right? So the N3C um, collaborative, PCORI, um, using privacy preserving record linkage, right? So we're using cryptographic hashing algorithms. Um, in this case, we're using Datavant, which is the proprietary software that uh, we subscribe to, but essentially it's a PPRL, privacy preserving record linkage uh, service, which builds site tokens um, across our different data contributors. So not just our own um, clinical data research warehouse here, but then the data contributors at the health departments, um, data contributors at Department of Corrections, data contributors at the Department of Professional Sa and Safety and Professional Services, which manages the, the prescription drug monitoring uh, program data and so on. So each of these data contributors are running the software locally on-prem, um, which allows them to then de-identify and build these hashed um, uh, tokens. And so they build site tokens, which then get converted to transit tokens when they're sent out for linkage to be received by a central hub. In this case, it's our linkage on its broker office in our School of Medicine and Public Health. And so what this looks like in the end is that we have these data contributors. So I mentioned our data source. So the UW Health System of uh, patients that we see, um, we're bringing in um, census tract data on these individuals. So the Census Bureau data, as well as what we've, uh, we have some socioeconomic um, scores as well called the Area Deprivation Index. Um, our data contributors at the Department of Safety and Professional Services, which runs the prescription drug monitoring program, they've signed on. Um, mind you, these are all separate data use agreements and uh, separate agreements uh, with software licensing and um, subscriptions to Datavant. The Department of Health Services Vital Statistics, which maintains all the death certificates for the state, the ambulance run data system, which is the pre-hospital data, so what happens in the field. So a lot of these patients are seen by ambulances, but don't end up coming to our hospital. The Department of Corrections for incarcerations, and there's a, a, there's a large database on, on a small handful of individuals there. An all payers claims database. Uh, we work with a company that provides us Medicare, Medicaid, and private commercial insurance. And then um, Datavent also has a mortality, national mortality database that actually refreshes every two weeks and they crawl obituary feeds and use the social security uh, administration um, master death file. And so we're trying to really get more comprehensive death data because um, while vital records gets us a lot of the um, state deaths and surrounding states, there are certainly individuals from across the country that were seen in our health system that may have um, died, as well as our own in-hospital and EHR capture of death is, is, can be biased too. So then from these um, data contributors, they run through the privacy preserving record linkage system and we build out tokens across each of these. At our health system, like I mentioned, we run our smart AI algorithm to identify cases as well as ICD codes to kind of be more thorough and rich our database for cohort identification. We use our linkage honest broker um, to link up all these uh, tokens across sites so that we have line level linkage in a longitudinal format. So this is actually a limited data set because we kept the timestamps. So we got rid of all the PH, other PHI, but we kept the timestamps so we can do 
metrics like 30-day readmission and um, uh, do time series analysis. And then out comes a delivered data set from the Honest Broker that's only given us the linkage, the linkages. And this is where now we're set up in a computing environment called the Data Commons because we have all these linked data sets. We have the uh, data science software services and um, Azure tools, business tools for reporting and, and whatnot. Now to give you a little uh, idea about why it helps to have some different um, approaches to core identification. In our case, when we looked at ICD-based codes for substance misuse across alcohol, opioids, non-opioids, then we had about 340 ICD codes that were related to um, adverse events and unhealthy use. Then separate from our NLP tool, the Smart AI, you can see there's some overlap, but actually our NLP tool identified cases that weren't identified and vice versa. Now, obviously with ICD codes, we tried to just get the ones that were not, uh, not present on admission. So there were new active codes that were captured during the encounter because certainly there could be a history of, of substance use disorders that maybe are in remission or, or not no longer active or whatnot. Um, whereas our NLP algorithm tends to capture more kind of real-time active disease using the notes and what's, what's identified from training against uh, screening tools. Separately, when it comes to outcomes and looking at deaths, we actually had a pretty um, interesting uh, set of information from the different sources of death that we have. So there's the EHR death that I described earlier, which you know they track all the, our, our, our uh, insured patients that die out of hospital because there's obviously financial reasons for that. The Wisconsin State Vital Records captures um, death certificates that are, have occurred um, and are registered with the state. And then there's a commercial death data source that I described earlier through DataVant, which is the, um, the Social Security Administration master death file, as well as kind of a, a proprietary uh, rule-based um, keyword uh, across an obituary feed crawl that's done every few weeks. And you can see that there are a handful of cases that were identified across each that weren't identified in the other. Now we tried to look at some, you know, sensitivity metrics on this because uh, in hospital deaths, we're pretty confident are real deaths. So we did a subgroup analysis where we took all our EHR and hospital deaths and compared the commercial deaths uh, to those and compared the Wisconsin vital records deaths to those. Now, obviously the vital records death was more sensitive. I think we had a sensitivity of about 85%, but the commercial death data source is actually close to 80%. So while there are a handful of um, uh, potentially false, um, false negatives and whatnot, that it was actually not bad. Interestingly, when we looked at the deaths from registered with the state versus what we registered in our EHR, there's bias there. Uh, we actually found a higher deprivation index in that table there of people that were identified by the state, but not by our health system. And this reflects people of lower socioeconomic status. So these are potentially people who are uninsured, experiencing homelessness, um, unfortunately, these are people that maybe the health system's not in, interested in tracking uh, as much because they're not um, insured payers. And so we, we, you can imagine then if you rely on, on your EHR data to do an outcomes, you know, health outcomes analysis using death, you actually may be biased based on this, especially in, in uh, cohorts like ours with substance misuse, which are more vulnerable populations. So what's the use case that we're currently working on um, for uh, the data commons is actually one of the things that's happening across our state. I don't know what happens in Alabama, but we have these what's called overdose fatality review teams at the county level where they actually pick out individual overdose cases and they, they, they actually manually bring together all these different data sources and then review the things and identify what were preventable things that could have been done. This has led to um, Narcan distributions, um, Test, fentanyl test strip uh, distributions, mobile van systems, um, harm reduction services. But it's, it's first of all, it's limited to only certain counties. Um, the analytic capacity is only limited to case studies um, using you know, manual retrieval data sources, so staffing is an issue. If we have enough health systems that can participate in our data commons, you can imagine that we have a representation for a county that we can actually do this automatically, right? And that if we use the data commons, we can actually do both cohort level analysis and individual levels across all the um, overdose deaths as well as other cause deaths for substance use. And so we're working with the ORFR teams now because they're actually very interested in getting more comprehensive data and, and we're kind of doing a proof of concept with this data commons from our health system with our local Dane County uh, ORFR team. 
So um, in summary, uh, I, I hope I was able to kind of describe to you guys the smart AI for clinical decision support, um, NLP driven for uh, health operations, as well as how it's used for uh, research and population health. Um, we do have a, a manuscript that has some pseudocode for um, the way we ran the uh, operational uh, smart AI. Uh, the trained model is, is open source and publicly available. It's in, I didn't put the um, link here, but I can share that. Um, the CTAKES is, is Apache CTAKES uh, open source as well. So we, we try to use a lot of open source tools. Um, certainly there's, there's things that are um, custom and unique to our pipeline with Microsoft Azure, Databricks, Cloverleaf for HL7, Epic. So, um, but some of the architecture principles can still be um, interoperable. I do wanna just put a plug in for one of the other things that we're doing. I know this is an active area of research for John as well. Um, trying to get at designing systems um, using NLP uh, for more of these generative frameworks. So moving away from information extraction, but we're interested in kind of doing diagnostic decision support um, and seeing if we can actually design NLP tasks that can evaluate this. Right now, a lot of NLP tasks are kind of focused on inherent NLP um, approaches or methods, but what if we try and design systems or build tasks that can be tested that are more reflective of maybe things that are used for clinical decision support. And so this figure kind of talks about what does that mean when you get to diagnostic reasoning, right? That there's a component of knowledge representation. There's the experience of the provider, you know, which is the kind of the EHR. Knowledge representation can be, you know, the textbooks and US, in the board exams and things like that, as well as the context in terms of what's happening to the individual at the individual level. And so there's this kind of goes through a deductive reasoning approach where you're trying to bring in, you know, test results combined with knowledge and trying to get at a final diagnostic for diagnostic decision support. And so that's the components to this of medical knowledge representation, clinical evidence integration, you know, using what's what's collected in the HR, and then kind of either doing summarization as an extractive or abstractive way to come up with a differential diagnosis or final diagnosis. So we do have a, a paper in a Git, GitLab repo that has six tasks that are designed for clinical NLP and more around decision support. Um, we designed three of them ourselves. Uh, three others we kind of pulled from the existing literature after doing a scoping review of all the clinical NLP tasks. So I encourage you guys, to, for those who are interested, to take a look at um, this benchmark uh, data set, which is called Dr. Bench, which has, it uses MetaNLI, which has been out there. We did an assessment plan reasoning, which it describes in there uh, to get at knowledge representation. The progress notes, SOAP notes section tagging, uh, board questions through EMR QA, med medical QA. And one of the hardest tasks for us is the problem summarization, which is if we give you a progress note and we give you everything up to the assessment, can you generate diagnoses? And we're actually built a, we're doing a bio NLP workshop for this at ACL for the NLP people on the call. Um, it's still open for sign up. So if you're interested in participating in this shared task, we'd love to have you come in. And as a community, we can work on this problem together, um, especially as more of these generative frameworks are coming into play. So that, I just want to give a plug for that. So um, I'll stop there. I think that's, uh, I appreciate the time that you guys have given me. Uh, thank you so much, Majid. That was a great talk. Um, I know I have a lot of questions myself, but um, I'd like to ask um, everyone else if uh, there's any any questions. Uh, yeah, uh, let me let me ask one, which always bugs me about these these efforts, which is, you know, we we kind of suffer from this sort of garbage in, garbage out phenomenon, or not so much garbage in, garbage out, but limited. We have limited information. And we try to make the most of it. And I'm wondering how we can, or if there was something that could be done with clinical documentation that would improve it at the source where it's created that would then make it easier and more make NLP work more accurate. Um, if you could wave a magic wand uh, and get doctors and nurses and you know specialists and you know so on to to document something differently, and and you, you personally didn't have to do it. <laughs> what would you what would you want to see that would make your work more effective? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, 
I think I would like to move more towards um, problem oriented charting. So where it's problem problem oriented centric, um, can we remove some of the administrative tasks that, that need to go into documentation practices? Can we remove some of the redundancy and noise that comes with it? And can we actually design our, our documentation to actually be more problem centric versus meeting the payer requirements? So I don't know if that, that if that's yeah. that gets at what you're trying to ask. Jen. Yeah, and it's ironic that Larry Weed published his paper back in I think 1966 or whenever yeah. it was for problem oriented yeah. medical records, and uh, you know we still we you know we have problem lists, yeah. but the documentation this is done that way. It's done you know, and and I don't know about it elsewhere, but UAB the notes I I can't figure out where to find like what what happened today. Yeah, or what's new because there's like all this old stuff. Like current problems, then new stuff, then the current assessment, and the, you know, with the medication plan, the medications are at the top and not at the bottom. You know, it's yeah. it's very hard to sort out. Maybe I'm just too old to read these notes. But no, you're right. Yeah, I mean, when I when I was in training, when I was when I was a resident, and then afterwards at Columbia, my notes were work. I did have problem oriented documentation. Um, the assess the you know the history of present illness and the physical exam were separate chunks. But then the the impression plan called on that stuff and it was organized that way. But you don't see that as much anymore. So, yeah, so that certainly would be um, helpful. So yeah. how do we how do we get people to do that without increasing the burden of documentation? That is, they're thinking it. Hopefully they're thinking in a problem oriented way and they're right. They're putting they're documenting all the stuff. It's just not maybe organized or as detailed as we would like. So any thoughts? I mean, I, I guess that's kind of off your, off your, you know, in a different direction than yeah. your research. But if we could figure out how to solve that and people like working on a lot of stuff like you and John would get some insights and go, you know, if they would only just do this thing, uh, it would make it, make this other stuff work much better. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And, and again, yeah, like you said, that's HCI is not my area of expertise and, and things like that. But I think one of the things that I don't know, I, I mean, I guess is it's kind of like do we prompt uh, providers and clinicians in a way from the electronic system to provide the, those necessary elements and try and uh, avoid the, the other things? Because I think what happens right now with a lot of these note templates is they're bringing in tons of information, they're embedding things in and they're Kind of just automating these these lists. So, I'm I'm a critical care doc, and so one of the things I did was when we went back to the critical care documentation committee. We actually rehashed it because what I was noticing that was happening is that our residents were doing systems based documentation where they would just list every organ system and describe what they're doing for that organ system, but there was actually not a diagnosis listed anywhere. So to your point, Jim, we couldn't figure out what the heck was was wrong with the patient at any given note. So we actually took all that out, and and what we do now is we, you know, we're 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 doing in servicing and training and retraining the residents and and folks to actually we took out the template and that provides that information. We don't allow any of of the automated stuff to come in, and we're asking them with a prompt to say, please provide the active daily diagnosis. <laughs> I don't know. Am I am I grabbing at yeah. straws with that approach? But it's it's a system wide implementation that we're doing, yeah. and it's forcing them to stop thinking systems approach and get back to problem based writing. But yeah. I don't know if that's going to fix it. I was going to ask yeah. you this question. Maybe. <laughs> well, like so more. yeah. I mean, I would. I I love. We have ten minutes, and John's got a bunch of questions. So, but yeah, I would think the the thing I would just say is to think about how do we uh, we have to in order to incentivize people to do this. We have, there has to be some payback. Uh, that is something has to be better for them and their patients. Uh, so for instance, if they, you know, if they document this, will the system do a bunch of things that reduce other documentation they have to do or improve the order entry process or, you know, improve communication with coordination with the rest of the team or, you know, I'm just thinking of things off the top of my head here, but Things that would make, so if I'm going to be required, if they're going to ask me to do something different in my documentation, even if it's not more work, it's just now I got to think about things a different way, which has more cognitive overhead. Yeah. Um, I want to do it. I'm going to do it if, if I know that as soon as I do that, something good is going to happen for me and my patient, um, you know, as a response. So I'll give you an example, a quick example. We had, when I was at Columbia, we had, um, 
this, you know, we had notes and you could, we had a medication list that used controlled terminology, but nobody would use it um, because, you know, it was too much work to go look up the drug and then put in the stuff. We didn't have order entry. Uh, so there was no, you know, they were just, so they would just put it in their node and I couldn't get them to use it. But then one day uh, we installed, it took us a, maybe a day to do it, a print prescription button so that it ran off that medication list. And I, and I can show you the data where the number of users of that function just increased over time linearly uh, with no advertisement other than me walking into the residence room where they had the printer and pulling out a bunch of prescriptions and going, oh yeah, we have a print prescription button now. And, <laughs> and, and just it just took the place by storm. Why? Because it was extra work, but they could they could perceive the immediate benefit to them, which was that they wouldn't have to write prescriptions, especially for renewals, they could just hit a button. So yeah. if we can figure out how to make it clear that if they do this, something good's going to happen, like maybe their orders, when they go to do orders, it'll be much more problem oriented and it'll anticipate, oh, you're working on this problem. So these are, when I type in these three letters, I'm going to pull up the orders that are really relevant to that problem. You know, I don't know. I don't know what that'll be, but that's, I think that's a way to tackle it. That's a great point. Yeah, thanks. And guided, you know, guided uh, documentation too. When I remember we had a system for for um, uh, dictation, dictating notes early on, and it would actually prompt you for different parts of the note. Mm -hmm. And so it would say, well, do the history present I, I remember what the, it was like a consult note or I don't remember what it was, but you, you and, you know, and it was just, it wasn't voice recognition. It was recorded. And then there was a transcriptionist who would type it up, but it would say, do this section, do this section, do this section. And that way, when you went through it, if you forgot a section, you would it would be reminded. And so now we had structured, not only structured notes, because each, each bit of text was associated with a header, but it was also more complete because people were prompted for that. Like you could prompt people on a screen and yeah. they see a big blank thing. It's like, oh, I got to fill this thing in. Um, but guiding people in how they document in a way that makes it, I think people a lot of times like, would like that because it's oh good I didn't forget this or yeah thanks for helping me construct this description of somebody's rash in a structured way that's going to be meaningful for other people that are going to see the rash or you know whatever yeah. that is so um anyway that's I, I, I've talked enough no, that's great <laughs> yeah John's we, got questions but that's that's, that's the way I like try to tackle. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah we did that kind of guided prompting on the documentation committee so we have to still test that and see how it affects um workflow thanks I, I do have questions but i should i think we should let the audience you know ask questions i can always ask majid a little bit later on so if there's anyone else in the audience who has a question uh please go ahead i see Someone's james hand up. james willig hey um thank you so much for a fascinating uh discussion i have uh so many questions um but i'm going to try to uh limit them to to two overarching uh, ones um, the first is I was fascinated about sort of taps one and taps two, and I was sort of looking out those those screening uh, instruments, and it seemed like you were using them to train your screening tools. And I was wondering uh, first um, if there was a if you if you want to do head to head between sort of this NLP screening approach versus the uh, just using patient reported outcomes, because I, I guess I've been around the patient reported outcomes cognoscenti for over a decade, and they boy they swear by it. So uh, I think you're going to need some hard proof to show those folks that yours is better. So I was curious if you'd done that or are anticipating that type of research. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So um, for, so the, the challenge is, is, so first of all, we trained it against the audit and DAS, which are kind of similar. But um, the challenge is that we trained it against these tools, right? So you're not necessarily going to necessarily be better at these tools because if you're training against them, that's, that's kind of the, the point. What we're doing with our study is actually we're looking at non-inferiority designs, James, is that we're not actually trying to show superiority. We're just trying to show, look, it's just as good, but the fact is that it brings in other benefits, which is automation and it's it reduces the staffing needs, right? Because what happened during, for, so for instance, at Rush, right, they, were cat, they, were, they had a catchment of 80% screening with that self-report questionnaire tool. COVID hit, dropped to 40% because they pulled that staffing to do other things. And so if we had an NLP algorithm in place that was just similar in performance or nearly as good, um, then you at least aren't letting those folks fall through the cracks and you're still 
providing an automated service. So we're actually designing these and we're evaluating these as non-inferiority designs and looking at cost effectiveness of these tools. And that can we reduce the staffing burden? Can we reduce the manual resources needed? Can we reduce the bills that are required as these self-report tools have to be implemented? And so we are going to do like we're uh, separate from what's going on right now. We're doing uh, we're actually now enrolling patients and and getting consent on these taps to compare it to our tool. Um, uh, but the problem is that you know you have, you have enrollment as a selection bias and people who are consenting to allow us to compare the, their self report to the to the taps. The other thing is that you have to keep in mind with these self report tools. There's a lot of under reporting. In one of our publications, we actually went back into the manual chart reviews and a false positives. And what was actually noted was that we actually found a lot of cases where they told the provider one thing, but they told the manual screener something else. Or yeah. the patient comes in yeah. and they're they're going through intoxication or, or something like that, but they're they're denying, right? Yeah. But which may not matter because if they're not motivated, they're not gonna you can't engage them for treatment yeah. or intervention. Yeah. So Majid, it struck me that in your Venn diagrams, so I published a paper about 10 years ago comparing what it says in our charts to what it says in the patient reported outcomes. And sort of the social desirability bias plays a huge role there, that people won't tell you something. But if you ask them alone in the HCI literature, you'll see that across sensitive subjects, there's actually more honesty from the patients there. But I've been around long enough and got enough gray hairs to see it all fail in different ways. Um, but I will tell you that with John, um, we have a clinic that's been doing patient reported outcomes since 2008. We've been doing substance use screening since 2008. And we have a, so just to compare those data versus the, um, versus the data of using the NLP to do it, you would have a large existing database to sort of validate and sort of run your non-inferiority trials, which I think is a brilliant way to go about your design. The, the second thing I, I want to say is, is I, I want to sort of ask you about this invitation that you've put forward. We find Oh, James, you got muted. Sorry. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry. Um, I, I want to respond to your or ask about your invitation in a, in a different way. Um, we find ourselves in a uh, in an intersection where we have to completely redo our course for treating clinical skill development and clinical reasoning. And it struck me that I was looking at the same diagram that you showed in terms of the problem presentation and, and, and so forth. Um, and I, and I was thinking of using that as the basis for the curricula and thinking of activities to do to do each one. So, you know, I think seeking to aid the clinical reasoning um, with these generative AIs um, is, is eventually what we grew up to. But would you be interested in growing up doing the part about how do we train students um, through these tools? And then I, I think that there's an opportunity for some there's a Venn diagram there. And I wanted to know if that was something you had in your conceptualization would be interested in. And if you are, I think you got another member for the task force in me. Yeah, no, I, you, so thanks for those comments and you bring up a great point. And it comes back to what, kind of what Dr. Simon was saying, like what if we actually use an NLP system that guided the documentation practices of the trainee, right? We actually train folks in a way, but you know, th there's a lot of nuances to that, but you know, if, if, if we train a system to do problem-based documentation, then we can do augmented education around that kind of, the, the same type of way that we, we want to train humans, right? And so that, that is one of the things that we've been thinking about, like, you know, something like this, and a generative system can be used to actually help overcome. Now, again, there, we haven't, we're far from it, but there's a lot of heuristics that happen, right, in medicine and these mental shortcuts that we take with anchoring bias, momentum bias, availability bias, all these things. Maybe if we actually use the evidence integration that with real-time data and actually generate real diagnoses that are active, uh, maybe an augmented system that can help overcome some of these cognitive uh, biases as well as cognitive burdens because we don't do evidence-based medicine very often at the bedside. We just kind of take the mental shortcuts because we're, we're, it's overwhelming, we're rushed, there's too much going on. Um, so I, I see their value here. I just, I, I, I think we have to figure out how to do it safely and fairly. <laughs> but yeah, I, I'd be happy to work with that on you, with you guys. Thank you, uh, Majid. I think we're we're out of time here. Um, I'll probably follow up with some questions with uh, Majid uh, later on, um, but maybe just throw one last one in here. Majid, can you just say anything about the total uh, cost of this? Not just the cost of the implementation, um, you know, but also like specifically, you know, running the cloud is typically expensive. So I'm wondering, you know, uh, is Epic, you know, cutting you a deal or like what are the, you know, the cost in terms of like programmer time? 
it's a huge system you got there yeah. involving a lot of different institutions in Wisconsin. So if you give me some sense of cost. I think that'd be great. Even if it's just ballpark numbers. Yeah. I mean, I, I think right ballpark is like, I think we're talking about two to three FTEs, hundreds of thousands of dollars to just get this fixed, this thing stood up. Um, we have a health economist on right now with us. And so we're kind of figuring out the fixed interval costs and what is, how do we actually measure what's going to be used for the larger infrastructure versus this use case. Um, it hasn't been cheap though. I don't know. I, I, I think our applied data science team has enjoyed the work and, and they are trying to find ways to, to kind of get, get it going. The, yeah. The economies of scale to kick in, but um, I think this is kind of new. I don't know if you guys have had more experience with this, but we're, I think we're still kind of figuring it out. So we're hoping to share those cost data in, in a publication, but our health economist is, is kind of working on it right now. And he's doing ICERs, incremental cost effectiveness ratio, where he ties it in with health outcomes. So we know per outcome, how much are we actually saving or, or costing? Right. So I, I just want to say thanks very much. Um, I've got to go to my next meeting. I will overdue already, but yeah, thank, thank you very you. much. We really appreciate the contributions. Appreciate it, your comments as well. Okay. Thank you, Majid. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Great talk. Thank you. Bye bye. Hey, John. Hey, how you doing? Pretty good. Um, you got a minute? Can I call you real quick? Uh, yeah, you can call me. I'm in the car. It's gonna be a little, gonna be a little loud, but uh, you can definitely call me. All good. I'll give you a call. Thanks. All right. Bye bye.